Though genetics and evolution may seem to go hand in hand today, when they were first proposed, people actually thought they were in conflict with each other. Let's talk about how these different theories were reconciled. There's a couple of th different things to talk about, about how evolution and genetics were integrated. First, we're going to talk about the modern synthesis, and then population genetics, one of the most important things to come out of the modern synthesis. We'll talk about the forces of evolution, um, the phrase survival of the fittest and why we shouldn't use it. And lastly, we'll talk about population genetic simulators, as these are great tools for how to actually understand what's going on. But first, let's start with the, the modern synthesis. Right now we're talking about something called paradigm change. This comes from a book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This is a fascinating way to understand the history of science and how science hasn't always been the same way it is today. Um, Kuhn here proposes a model where most of the time we spend in normal science. We have a paradigm that scientists believe in, that they are following, and all of their research goes according to that paradigm. But eventually that model or paradigm, it will drift and people will eventually start to notice things that don't fit within that paradigm, things that do not fit with those expectations. So eventually it will lead to a period of crisis where there is a recognized problem and people are working to try and figure out how to solve it and how to come up with a new paradigm. Um, so some people will come up with a couple different um, ideas. Um, we will discuss and we'll fight about which one is most appropriate. And eventually after that revolution, we will have a paradigm change. We'll have a new paradigm. Um, and then that will lead to a new period of normal science. Um, of course, we this happened first with Darwin. He proposed his theories. People got really up in arms about it. But over overall, people... Um, came to mostly accept his theories. But remember, even though Mendel and Darwin were contemporaries, um, Mendel's work was not recognized until after his death. So essentially, Mendel's work was later when we're talking about the scientific community and how they were interacting with his knowledge. Um, but let's talk about the insights we got from them. From Darwin, he gave us the mechanism of natural selection. He also told us that variation is important. And of course, this population thinking. We need to be looking at a population, not a single individual. Because remember, evolution happens to a population, not individuals. From Mendel, we got a couple different things. First, we got an idea of how heredity actually works, how traits are passed on from offspring or from parents to their offspring. Um, we also got this idea of particulate inheritance and, of course, dominance. Um, but after these two men um, had passed away, they had several different followers. So people who strongly believed in Darwin called themselves naturalists, and people who followed Mendel called themselves geneticists. Um, and in the decades after these gentlemen passed away, there was a couple prevailing points that people in these two camps believed. Naturalists, um, of course, appreciated variation, but they actually still believed in blending inheritance. Geneticists, on the other, time, other hand, they had this idea that there was a wild type, the thing you find in the wild, and mutants, the, you know, the weird stuff you create in the lab by messing with it. Yeah, uh, we've, we've done a lot of that with radiation, which isn't like particularly nice to the cells we do it on, but hey, we've learned a lot. Um, but geneticists also believed in particulate inheritance. Of course, we know now that both of them were wrong or were right in some ways. So of course, naturalists were right in the appreciation of variation, but they were wrong in blending inheritance. And geneticists, they were wrong about the wild type and mutants, um, but they were correct about particulate inheritance. And this is part of the reason why it was so difficult to reconcile these different viewpoints, because both camp was right about something, but had an incorrect belief about an, the other. So it took some time for people to be able to recognize how um, we could combine these different th theories. And that came about in the modern th synthesis. So the modern synthesis happened in the 1940s, um, and these are a couple of the key figures. Um, there are a few more, but the biggest ones are Ernst Mayer, Theodosia Stobzanski, R.A. Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright. Um, what happened is now we started to have people who were trained in mathematics um, and biology. Because part of the problem with evolution is it happens on the population level. So you need to be much more sophisticated with how you deal with math because now you're dealing with statistics and summary measures rather than looking at a single individual. It is a lot more complicated, and that's part of the reason why I think this took so long.
So let's take a look at what happened. First with Darwin, we got these, these couple ideas. Variation is important. Natural selection is um, one of the main mechanisms for evolution, but also we have to look at the level of the population. And then adding with um, from Mendel, we got these mechanisms of heredity um, and now we have a new field called population genetics and also the ideas of mutation, that new things can arise um, because now we have an idea of how heredity works. Here's a slightly more complicated diagram that someone else created. Um, and this is also interesting because it shows that at different, um, in different syntheses, we actually rejected some information that we thought was true. So some of the things we got from the modern synthesis of like, inheritance is only through DNA, there's only gene selection and the genome is isolated, we now no longer believe is true be due to the integrated synthesis. That is much more recent. It happened in the 1970s. Um, and this one is about ontogeny in evolution or changes in development. And actually it's so cool how like really tiny changes can create a cascade of effects. Um, I highly recommend you read this book by Sean Carroll, Endless Forms Most Beautiful, um, which is about um, evolutionary development and a lot about what we learned in this integrated synthesis. So what is the modern synthesis and why is it so important? <music>